um, your videos. And uh, if you want to ask a question during the course of um, Emma's presentation, um, ask it through the chat and that way you won't forget the question and we'll go back into the chat and look at the, the questions uh, at the end of um, Emma's presentation. And also, of course, once we start um, talking generally and are answering questions, then of course you, you're welcome to unmute yourself and, and, and ask a question or just continue to put it into the chat at, and you access the chat through the bottom sort of panel across the bottom of your screen. So Emma, please, would you like to take over the um, presentation now uh, and start your your talk about big hearted gardens? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Francesca, for the lovely introduction. And um, can I just say as a as a recipient of the Nina Crone um, Award, it was um, it's actually um, personally been a really beneficial thing to be able to um, have the space and time to actually work on an article that had been bouncing around in my head for for quite some time. So I think it's a really worthy cause and important for emerging writers too. So um, so yeah, great to see everyone here virtually. Uh, and thank you to the Australian Garden History Society for asking me to present, giving me this opportunity. So um, I just wanted to provide just first a little bit of background about myself. So, uh, so I've got a background in uh, landscape architecture uh, as well as human geography. And um, I, I've got about 15 years of experience working in design practice uh, across New South Wales, Tasmania, and more recently, Victoria. Um, but I've always combined my design practice with teaching, writing, and research as well, because I, I kind of love this process of moving back and forth between different modes of thinking, and I and I think they feed into each other in in really interesting ways. Um, and a few years back, I uh, branched out on my own to establish a small business. So plantary landscape architecture is is still quite young, um, but since then we've been focusing on small to medium scale residential designs across Victoria, uh, and we've got a, a growing emphasis on native climate resilient and biodiverse gardening. So um, earlier on this year, I found myself in the position, hang on, there we go. I found myself in the position of um, doing exactly that. So I was writing an article for the Journal of Australian Garden History about suburban gardens in Melbourne. Um, and at the same time, I was actually creating a competition garden for the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. And this dual process of writing and thinking on one hand and then intensive construction on the other really got me thinking. Um, and I think you can almost see me doing it here as so I'm gazing at my garden space. Um, but what I was thinking about is the purpose of show gardens and their potential social and environmental contributions uh, as quite specific forms of landscape display. And I guess here I was trying to understand why I was doing what I was as a, as a landscape architect and whether anything lay behind this initial appearance of show gardens as a beautiful thing that we might want to consume. And so as I was really coming to this thinking, um, I, I was really an outsider to the show garden industry. So prior to 2023, the only thing I really knew about show gardens was from photos in magazines where they seemed both to be impossibly beautiful and perfect and almost like a fantasy garden that you would never be able to have because they're just quite expensive and, you know, out of reach for most people. Um, and a friend once described show gardens as uh, outdoor theatre sets. And I can kind of relate to this view because show gardens are really highly contrived and temporary landscapes that are not really intended to grow and change over time or, or really be inhabited like your back, backyard garden might be. So in reality, they're, they're much more like garden symbols to me. Um, and they point to the, the, latest, the latest garden fashions and they showcase new products. But they, at the same time, they can also reflect deeper ideas. And here's an example of one 
uh, that was at Mifka's in 2023. And this was Peter Donegan's beautiful Bamstone Garden, uh, which was the winner of the gold medal in 2023. So when I say show gardens are like symbols, I don't, I don't mean that they're superficial or meaningless as such, just that they're they're different in a way to the gardens that we might experience as part of everyday life. So this reminds me of a quote by the historian Simon Sharma, and he says in Landscape and Memory, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is built up as much from strata of memory as from layers of rock. And I love this quote because I think it's a really good reminder that gardens are always viewed through our own lenses of experience. Um, and there's really no hierarchy of realness when it comes to measuring the worth of a garden space. But I, I think I would actually go further than this to say that gardens also affect us and work on us. And they're definitely not just passive objects or outdoor stages for human activity. Um, and they work upon us in a, a very real and active way. And show gardens really are no different to this, but I think it's important to be aware of the types of messages that are being conveyed by these quite powerful spaces. So just like any artistic work, the creation of every show garden involves a complex process of planning, making, collaboration and communication, which gives them a real sense of energy and potential, I think, in the public sphere. And what you're seeing here is an example of the complexity that lies under the surface of any typical show garden. Uh, in this case, it was the construction of the raised platform under Ian Barker's 2015 garden, Crossroads. So this behind the scenes understanding of a show garden is what I'd really like to talk about this evening. And not only the complexity that goes into creating one, but I wish to explore the different ways that show gardens might have an impact that extends well beyond that moment when the gates close and all the, the visitors go home. So to do this, I'd like to share with you the story of two gardens that I've been involved in over the past couple of years. So while quite small, each of these designs began with just a grain of an idea, and then they evolved into a project with a life of its own. So I'll first talk about how the project began and unfolded from a tentative idea to a complex construction project involving many different moving parts. And then I'll explain a bit about how we built each garden and the public response to it, and then the ongoing legacy of the gardens. So the first one was called A Place For Us, and A, a Place For Us emerged through a competition that was actually run by Open Gardens Victoria to build a garden at, at Mifka's. Uh, and that was actually gonna be part of their, their marquee for the Open Gardens stall. So, for the competition entry, I arrived at three main ideas or themes that I wanted to explore through the design. Uh, and the first one was gardens as a, a place for social connection. And the second idea was gardens as a place for biodiversity, in particular, suburban biodiversity. And the third idea I wanted to discuss was um, a place for women in construction or, or on the construction site. So I found out that I had won the competition in late January 2023, uh, and this gave me around about seven weeks to plan the garden, to get my team on board, and then build it at the show. And at the time, I actually didn't know that many people in Melbourne being quite new to Victoria, so seven weeks to do all of that kind of felt like a big stretch because I didn't have networks to, to build on, but um, yeah, everything kicked into gear at that point. Here is the original render from my competition entry. And as you can see here, um, vibrancy and color was a really important driver of the early concept. And this was reflected in the wall, the edging and the flower meadow at the front of the space. And in doing this, I wanted to create a place that reflected uh, the kind of the bright spot that gardens and plants had been 
for many people during the COVID lockdowns, uh, and especially the role of gardens in supporting people's physical and mental health during this time. Um, but I've also, I've always loved gardens that are kind of wild, and I wanted to design as much variability into the garden as I could. And above all, I wanted it really to be an accepting place, um, and a place where people would feel welcome to just come in, sit a while and be embraced as part of a bigger ecosystem. So I didn't want to alienate people with, with the design that I was making. So this is the first planting plan I developed. Um, and the main idea here was to encourage biodiversity through uh, the use of a wide variety of native plants, as well as incorporating natural materials such as timber, stone, old logs and crushed rock into the design. Uh, the plant species were selected according to what would be flowering at the time um, or at their best for the week of the show in early April. And this is actually really difficult to plan for because, um, well, plants don't generally care for human schedules. So um, really it, it, it is always a bit of a punt at, as to what is going to be performing for you at the time. And some of the plants didn't. So you always have to make those last minute substitutions. Uh, the design itself had lots of nooks and crannies for habitat. Um, these were found particularly in, in the Gabion wall and in amongst the different types of plants and in the variation created by um, debris on the ground level, such as timber logs, mulch and boulders, and also a pond. And by doing this, I wanted to demonstrate how native gardens can be a refuge for the many types of animals, insects and microscopic creatures that tend to live in suburban areas. And these ideas were reflected in the design and aesthetics of the garden. Um, but I also wanted to draw attention to the construction process and in particular, the, the role of women in the landscape and construction industries. And so this was reflected in the decision to work with an all female construction team to design, plan and build the garden. And the intention here was to showcase the work of women currently working in the landscaping industry. Uh, as well as to encourage women who might be considering a career in this area. And as we started to move through this idea, or as I started to move through this idea, um, I realised that this would actually be the first time that this had been attempted in the history of, of the Melbourne Garden Show um, and possibly at any garden show previously. We've not, actually not found any evidence to, to say it's been done before. So... At that point, it became really exciting and we sort of thought, you know, this is this might be actually a groundbreaking project in the history of MIFCAs. So, you know, and that was a really a big driver for the, some of the momentum, I think, that we, we started to encounter. So just to take a little diversion into some statistics around the issue of women's participation. So you can see that there is still quite limited female participation in certain sectors of the industry. So in 2023, women made up only 5% of the total workforce in landscaping. And this was even less in other trades such as carpentry and stonemasonry. And in comparison, female participation in landscape design and horticulture is relatively high, which is great, but Clearly, a bit more needs to be done to encourage women into the construction sectors as well. And of course, in relation to this, positive representation is a key issue. Uh, and it's important to show that there are a diverse range of women who are already working in the industry while continuing to explore the potential barriers to um, other sorts of participation. So as, a, as an example, many of our volunteers had really quite similar stories of applying for a trade apprenticeship early on in their careers, only to find that a very few businesses would give them a go. And it was really hard to sort of, you know, break, break through, especially in competition um, with the men. So while the reasons for this are probably quite complex and varied, um, we wanted to counter this by showing women participating in a range of roles and levels in the industry. 
And then this brings me to the subject of our volunteers. So early on, I had kind of flippantly thought that I'd be able to build the garden with the assistance of maybe a few students and a couple of paid landscapers. Uh, however, I realized pretty quickly that I was actually going to need a larger team and quite a variety of professional trades, uh, as well as a range of general volunteers for the project. So given that I needed an all-female team as well, uh, at that point I decided to approach encouraging women in horticulture to see if they could put out a call to their members for any female volunteers with trade skills. Uh, and they were really happy to do that for me and they ended up being incredibly supportive of the project. Uh, and actually, this turned out to be the best move I could have made because within about three days of me emailing them, I had received a flood of emails and calls from women who were really keen to volunteer and to be part of the team. So really, I was I was very lucky in this respect. And the total team in the end involved 23 incredible women who all contributed to the project in different ways. And you can see this diagram here shows the incredible diversity of skills that we had across the team um, from trades such as carpentry and landscaping to specialised knowledge in horticulture and design, social media, marketing and artists as well. And many of these volunteers also then called upon their own professional networks to assist. So the project at that point just leapt ahead um, from that point onwards. So the team was also quite varied in terms of age, life situation and place of residence. And as you can see from the demographics here, um, we're a diverse group with busy lives, including full-time work, running small businesses, caring responsibilities, studies, and in some cases, all of the above. So the work on site was also pretty time consuming and energy intensive. So it was especially amazing to see the level of dedication to what we were doing in the, in, from the volunteers. I'd like to just quickly focus on just a couple of the volunteers and their stories. So this is Anna, who was one of the first women to put her hand up for the project. And you can see her here testing out our stage with her quite impressive ballet skills. So take, taking the idea of a theatre stage quite literally. Uh, and a few weeks in, I asked Anna if she'd be willing to be my uh, second in charge, which she was. And this was really another lucky break because Anna has a background in transport, logistics and landscaping. And this became invaluable in the planning and, and construction process. Just go back to Anna for a minute because... Um, this was actually a little time-lapse video of the first day that Anna and I met at the Carlton Gardens. And we got, we met to measure the levels of the site in the rain, actually. And I'd actually just optimistically turned up with a six metre tape measure and a bit of string and hoping to measure the levels. Whereas Anna turned up with her ute full of tools, including a professional laser measure, um, a time-lapse camera, tripod, even an extra jacket for me when it started raining. So you, as you can see, Anna's experience on the site became um, really handy and it complemented my skills uh, in, in ways that was really necessary. This is another of our volunteers, uh, Shannon Blackburn from Canberra. Um, so Shannon runs her own professional landscaping business, Panacea Landscapes. Um, but she's also a busy mother of four, including two small toddlers. And Shannon made the nine hour drive down to Melbourne in her ute, again, with all of her tools. And she spent the whole week helping us out on site. So this level of generosity was actually really typical of the team. And it reflected the enthusiasm that the volunteers brought to the project as well as their passion for supporting other women working in the industry. And I was, I was really quite blown away by the, the support. And here is a page just for the volunteers because uh, they deserve it uh, and because their involvement was absolutely key to the success of the project. And it wasn't all smooth 
sailing though. Like we did have a moment of um, kind of terror just before the show began or just before the, the construction began where we thought, oh, oh no, what have we done? Have we bitten off more than we can chew? And that was really just because, you know, all of us were strangers to each other. We'd never worked with each other as a team before. Um, but also none of us had experience building a show garden. So the whole process was was basically new to us. But um, that was, we didn't need to be worried because everything went quite smoothly, um, which was amazing considering the circumstances and any issues that arose on site, we just worked out as we went along. So the feeling of camaraderie and support was one of the most positive aspects of the project. So the bump in involved six days on the site where we put all of our preparations to the test to build the garden. And six days might sound like a long time, but it actually went like, like that with um, everything that was going on. And we organised the volunteers into three teams. So we had the construction team, a horticulture team, and just general volunteers, although everyone was quite flexible and just chipped in wherever they were needed on site. Um, and we were also really lucky to have Kate Ashton from Kate Ashton Landscaping on site, who stepped into the role of the site manager to direct the construction and kind of crack the whip to keep us to a schedule. And that was really important too. And so after all of that hard work, um, here was the final result. Uh, so the all-female team was amazing and worked incredibly well together to design and construct the garden. So we were really proud of what we achieved in the end. But in terms of getting the word out about our theme, um, it was also an incredibly important part of the garden planning. And a few weeks in, uh, we met another really helpful Kate, um, Kate Anderson from the OGV marketing team, who got the ball rolling with a media release for the project. Um, and thanks to Kate's efforts, I was approached by journalist Megan Backhouse of The Age for an interview. Uh, a Place for Us was just one of two gardens that she wrote about that year. Um, and so we were really happy to receive that kind of recognition. And the project was also given a write-up in other forums. So, for example, Hort Journal, the Ballarat Courier, Ballarat Times, and the, the Melbourne University newsroom as well. But I've got to say the, the absolute highlight was uh, having Costa and the crew from Gardening Australia visit the garden and film a segment for their show. Um, and it was such a memorable experience meeting Costa and his crew and Honestly, he's as enthusiastic, friendly and beardy as uh, he is on the show in real life. So he's a truly lovely man. It was great to meet him. And finally, the icing on the cake was winning the best visual display for exhibitor prize at the Mifkus for OGV. And this was awarded on the basis of the judges who had observed our construction process over the whole week. Um, as well as the final visual result and the reaction of members of the public towards the garden. And speaking to, to many show visitors during the four days, we found that many people found the garden to be warm, welcoming, and something that they could imagine in their own gardens at home, which was pretty much exactly the, the hope that I had for the design um, before it was built. So this feedback meant as much to us as the other accolades that that we'd got so it was pretty good so this was a great conclusion to the show and we felt that all the planning and preparations had really paid off just to sum up um, the experience was certainly a lot of planning and hard work uh, it was also a huge amount of fun as you can see we met some wonderful people in the industry and also outside of the industry at the pub <laughs> Um, and we increased our professional networks and we made some great friends and we all grew our confidence in what we thought we could achieve. Also, the enthusiasm about the project uh, has convinced us really that there's a lot of potential for further work in this area. Uh, many of the volunteers have kept in touch and many of us are continuing on to collaborate on projects when we can. Uh, and you'll see an example of this in uh, the next project that I would like to discuss. 
Okay, so the the second show garden that I was involved in was called Oasis. And this was part of the border garden competition in Mifka's this year. And so Oasis as a border garden was a quite a different type of garden to a place for us. Uh, for one thing, it was much smaller. So it was only 2.4 metres squared. And it was just limited to plants with no structural components at all. And this shows us the, the original expression of interest that we put in for the garden. And we were lucky to be selected as one of the 16 finalists in the competition, and which was organised by the, the London School of Garden Design and Brent Reid. Um, and this garden was designed as a collaboration with La Muxlow Gardens. Um, and La was one of the original volunteers from A Place for Us, uh, where I noticed really early on that La was an incredibly talented garden designer um, and a bit of a genius at sourcing plants and liaising with nursery owners. Uh, so at the end of the project um, last or the year before, we agreed that we wanted to work together again and um, possibly at Mifkas. And then when the opportunity came up to apply for the border garden competition, we just, we leapt at the chance to work together again. So in terms of the design, we, we really wanted the design to be a, a water wise and biodiverse garden that would be appealing to suburban gardeners as well. And so to achieve this, we used a combination of succulents and cacti to create firstly a strong uh, sculptural structure for the garden. And then we integrated softer perennials and flowering ground covers to soften the look of the overall space. We also always planned to have a small feature tree and we were originally thinking a Queensland bottle tree but after going to the nursery and seeing the size of the, the specimens they had at the nursery, we revised this idea pretty quickly because they were, they were huge. And similar to um, a place for us, approaching sponsors was a really important part of the planning uh, and also a really nice way to build new networks with plant growers in the Melbourne region. So because we were looking for interesting and unusual sculptural cacti and succulents we we approached living sculptures and they're a specialty nursery um, specializing in arid plants at, at they're out at Tyab on the Mornington Peninsula and it's run by Mark Cohen and um, his daughter Ilona uh, who are we found to be incredibly knowledgeable and helpful and they invited us to come out and just have a look at their nursery and just wander around and as you can see here, a very small selection of a really truly impressive nursery with huge range of plants. So that was really exciting. Um, so in the end, they actually generously agreed to donate most of their plants to us for the show. Um, and the reasons for that I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later, but that was really generous. When we went out to Living Sculptures, we also saw a, a really unusual tree, which we kind of fell in love with. Uh, and this, this tree is called a fragrant, a fragrant Bursera. Um, scientific name is Bursera phagoroides. Um, and this is a tree that is native to South America. Um, this particular species had been bonsai in a pot and it was actually over 40 years old. So it was a really special specimen and Mark Cohen was kind enough to lend us the tree for the duration of the show. This was an amazing level of trust as the tree was actually intended for his own private garden. Um, but if if we had damaged it, we would have been liable for a $15,000 payment for it. So there was definitely some breath holding as we were loading it up into the truck. So we later found out as well that the Bursera is a really special and unusual tree for other reasons. So it's actually known as the, the frankincense of the Americas because it has a, a very distinctive, strong fragrance that has been used in um, incense and traditionally for medicinal and uh, ceremonial uh, purposes as well. So this actually made it even more special to have as part of our little garden. And we ended up just referring to the tree as, as 
um, Bertha. So he gave, gave her a name and it was a, a female tree as well. So she was really special. And here is the final garden. Um, again, really happy with the way that it came together. And we felt that the, the planting contrast, the colours and the textures of the garden pretty closely reflected our vision. And on the first day of the show, we were also really thrilled to find out that we'd been awarded first prize in the competition. So it was brilliant to get that kind of re recognition again for the time and effort that we'd put into putting it together. So a couple more images from the garden. So some other elements were selection of feature rocks from Castlemaine and Yarrabee, uh, copper, bar uh, copper bird bath rather from outdoor showers, and three ceramic birds from Blanche Ceramics in Melbourne. Um, the edging was from Shapescaper Steel and the lighting by Gardens at Night. And most of these materials were donated to um, use in the garden. Even though it was a competition, the atmosphere in the Border Gardens area was really supportive as well. And it was great to meet many of our neighbouring garden designers, as well as to have opportunities to chat and network with some of the bigger designers at the show. But just like in 2023, the show itself was a whirlwind of talking to people uh, and events, and it was lovely to, sh to see the other show gardens come to life as well. Um, and for anyone who went to the show this year, they'd know that there seemed to be a particular focus on native gardens and sustainability and, and quite a few female designers as well for the big gardens. So, and that was really wonderful to see. All throughout the planning though, I'd been considering the question of what we would do with our plants after the show. And one of the things that I'd hoped to do with a place for us was to donate the plants to a charity, uh, possibly a school, a community garden or a disability service. And this was a, a, an idea that was quite close to my heart um, because my own daughter has been a long-term outpatient at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And after asking around a few places, I actually decided to approach the hospital to see if they would like to receive a donation of plants for their gardens there. And their um, RCH therapy garden coordinator, Dan Wheels, got back in touch with me and said while the hospital didn't typically accept in-kind donations, they just happened to be looking for plants at that time to expand their therapy garden program at the hospital. Um, and then this was really exciting because we started to realise that there might be some possibilities for other show designers to donate plants and native plants to the hospital as well, and perhaps for us to take on a coordination role to actually make this happen. So when it was time to pack up our garden, there was a bit of a process in figuring out how to collect all of the different plants from, from all of the designers who had donated them around the show. Um, there was about eight designers who participated in the end. And then what we did was stockpile them in a safe place to be picked up by the, the Royal Children's Hospital. And here you can see a final photo of the stockpile the, of the plants that were donated and then ready to head off to their, their new home at the hospital. Uh, and the guy you see here is Dan, who came and took multiple trailer loads of plants back to the hospital on the, on the bump out day. So it was quite a frenzy of activity and, and a big effort from everyone involved. But now the show has finished. Um, in the in the past um, few months, they've been busy planting the the therapy gardens out with the plants we donated. So, I recently had a chance to visit the the RCH therapy gardens to have a chat to Dan and his team and see how the plants had been used. So the gardens there had been originally designed as a sensory garden within the hospital grounds and. It's a really important place there where patients and families can come to um, to diminish the negative effects of being hospitalised, um, also to evoke a feeling of kind of a, a backyard garden space, so a little bit like everyday life. 
um, but also as a space where they can focus on healthy aspects of self to improve the, the recovery process. And you can see here some of our plants that had been integrated into the gardens, which are quite loose and organic in style and similar to a home backyard. Um, they can contain uh, beds for veggies, herbs and flower patches, and the gardens are just constantly evolving. Uh, the food gardens there also form an important therapeutic environment for adolescents who are uh, attending the hospital eating disorder clinic. So that's one really important part of it. Arts and crafts, uh, crafts are uh, also a vital part of the program, uh, and these often take on a nature-based theme. And plants uh, like the succulents that we donated um, were very useful for workshops as they're just really easy to propagate and pot up, and actually many of those cuttings get taken home as small gifts for friends and family as well. Uh, and when I was chatting to Dan, he actually said to me, uh, about the gardens, he said, um, we can have difficult conversations as well as lots of fun and the magic works on parents and staff too. Gardening keeps us all grounded and provides useful metaphors to make sense of feelings. So I, I really loved visiting the gardens afterwards and it was, it was really nice to realise that our plants from the show were going to actually grow up and be part of this amazing program potentially for years to come. So we hope to repeat this type of initiative in future years at the show, uh, perhaps with more specific idea of designing and, store, and installing a therapy garden for a community organisation that needs it. So to wrap up a little bit um, and returning to the question that I posed at the beginning of the presentation, how do show gardens contribute to broader social initiatives? I think... Now, having seen quite a few other show gardens that have already done this at, at Mifkus in various ways, plus my recent two smaller experiences, I, I think I can see three ways in which this could be done. Firstly, uh, and probably the most obvious contribution was that the show makes is to the horticultural and landscaping industries themselves. So creating a show garden can be an amazing catalyst for networking and industry links, including those that foster collaboration, mentoring and support for small business owners like myself. I know that the, the number of new contacts that I made in only two years of participating has been incredibly helpful for establishing my business here in um, Melbourne and regional Vic. Um, but also the industry links made with other female landscapers as, as part of a place for us have also been really useful in providing information and support to each other. The second area I think where show gardens could make an impact is in the donation of materials and or plants to community causes after the show is packed down. So when you're part of the construction phases at the show, you, you realise that there's a massive volume of stuff that goes into constructing show gardens. And unfortunately, a lot of materials still go to waste uh, at the end of the show. So from plants to pavers, surfacing, mulch, structures, timber frames, rocks, you name it, it's in a show garden. So And a lot of that ends up in skips. Uh, as we found with Oasis, it... I think it really just needs somebody to bridge the connections between show designers and community groups. And this ideally would be facilitated by the show itself. Uh, and if so, there could be a lot of potential to both reduce waste and to contribute to ongoing benefits for uh, community organisations who normally couldn't afford landscaping uh, supplies. And the third contribution I can see is about the power of show gardens to draw an audience and become a platform for important cultural and social issues, especially those that are related to the positive benefits of gardens for people and the environment. I think the momentum of the show itself, which has thousands of people walking through the gates every day in combination with various modes of publicity, um, print and social media, means that the message can today spread really far and wide and there's a lot of potential. So 
just as one example, when we tallied up the potential reach of a place for us based on the coverage we received in print media, television and social media, we worked out that the project had a potential audience of around 7 million viewers. Uh, of course, not all of those viewers would have been online watching at the same time, but the potential is just definitely there for this quite big impact and a kind of snowballing impact as well. So I think it's it's quite exciting. But from a much smaller personal perspective, the two gardens that I've been involved in at Mifka's have had a, quite a big personal and professional impact on me and also the people who I have worked together there with. So for any emerging designers out there, I'd highly recommend getting involved in the show and which, whichever way you can or have capacity for and further exploring this idea of what a show garden can or could be in the future. And I'll, I'll wrap it up there. So thank you very much for listening. And I'll now pass it back to Jennifer to field any questions. Thank you very, very much, Emma. That um, was really lovely. And I'm sure everyone's giving you a really good round of applause at home, even though we've got them all <laughs> muted. <laughs> Just have to feel the vibes there. Now, there are some questions already been posted up. So I'll just uh, start at the top, I guess. And Nancy Clark, uh, who says it was a great presentation. Emma loved it all, um, and especially the women's teams. Um, but she wants to know about a little bit more about barriers for women who want to enter the landscaping industry. You know, what do you think? perhaps people could, could try and do to overcome some of those barriers? Mm -hmm. Big well, question. I, it is a, it's a really good question. I think it's, it is quite a complex issue. And I think um, there's, there's probably quite detailed research out there about it. Um, but I, I actually think, you know, as I said in the, in the presentation a little bit about the issue of representation is quite huge and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about people seeing and businesses seeing and other, you know, women who might want to enter the industry. Um, all of the people involved in the industry need to see that women are already working in the industry and doing a fantastic job. So, you know, for example, the, the example that I gave of businesses just kind of not wanting to give young women a go, maybe because they're perceived as, risky choice or something, I'm not sure. But um, if it just becomes normalized, then I don't I don't see that that would just even be an issue to think about. So the more normalized it becomes through representation and through, you know, women women coming up through apprenticeships and entering the industry, I think the the easier it's going to be for future women who want to enter the industry. Thanks. So Thank yeah. You. Um, so a more practical question now, um, Lynn Barrett wants to know, where do you source your large metal sources from? I think they were the ones that... Oh, the, the, um, the copper the copper bowl, the bird yes. bar. Yeah, yeah, that one was from uh, a company called Outdoor Showers. They're down on the, the Mornington Peninsula. And, yeah, they're lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Highly There's recommended nice. them. They're beautiful bowls and they develop this gorgeous um, patina over time. So they kind of get these rings of green and they're, they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, now Anne is saying uh, how heartbreaking it must be to, to pull the gardens apart. Uh, and she was very pleased to see that they're being um, repurposed. Um, she said, how much repurposed material do you incorporate in your design? So it's mm. sort of going into the other direction of you sourcing the materials. That's a that's a very very good question. Currently, I I don't do a lot of construction work. I in my business I do mainly design uh, concept work at present. But um, in the future, as the business expands, I'll be moving more into construction, and that is absolutely something that I would I would love to do. So you know, wor working with what's on site already is always a really good, you know, and it's cost effective too. So you always want to do that. But, you know, I just think, especially if it's natural material like rock or, you know, what's been there before has a, a nice sense of the, the site's history. And it's always a really good idea to incorporate that wherever you can uh, and recycle stuff wherever possible. Yeah. I just was at the Chelsea Flower Show last month and a lot of the gardens there were actually deliberately built to to be repurposed and rebuilt 
and some of them actually were given sponsorship to build the garden in the first place so that it could be rebuilt somewhere else. So that's almost taking it to another level of, of total planning for the gardens to exist in another place. Yeah. Another there's yeah. there's some great work being done at the moment. And even um the salt bush garden at this year's um Mifkas by Fiona Brockoff and Philip Withers. They they had a real a, a specific approach on that kind of reuse and repurposing and and sustainable sourcing as well. And um, anyone who's interested in that kind of thing, look up their garden because it was beautiful. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and we didn't ask you if you got that tree back, that fifteen thousand dollar tree, got back safely to its home. <laughs> we did. We did get it back. It was it was a, it was quite nail biting because the the truck that we'd hired wasn't quite high enough. So we had to very slowly just bend the top boughs of the tree just and when when we got to the show and we opened the back of the truck, the smell of the the incense kind of frankincense smell was amazing. <laughs> but the tree was fine. The tree was well packed safe. Yeah. Um Tim's got a lovely Tim Entwistle's got a lovely comment for you. Excellent presentation, Emma, and loved your written contribution to the AGH. AGS magazine. Of course, Tim is our patron. Um, so thank you for that, Tim. Uh, another question. No, another compliment from David Shepherd. Excellent presentation. Um, Elizabeth Shepherd, great presentation. And thank you for your teamwork with women. Um, Francesca says, do you think the partnership with the hospital will encourage more uh, such community initiatives with MIFCUS um, mm -hmm. and more broadly? I really hope so. Uh, I mean, the the hospital partnership was a little bit unusual, as I said, because they they normally don't accept um, donations of stuff just because they don't have the capacity to process lots of things. Um, they normally just take funding donations. But I think there are lots of smaller community groups that might have a little bit more flexibility with that kind of thing. And, you know, what... A, would be great to see is is actually show garden designers setting up those collaborations quite early on in the process and then you know there's a sort of a, a design that happens understanding that it will go to a different type of environment afterwards and you know often it's not the same you can't really it's hard to reproduce a show garden in an actual landscape because they're often quite sort of tight and plants yeah. need room to spread and move and yeah, but, you know, it's nice to have the different phases, I think, as well. So I hope that happens in the future more and more. And certainly if you're planning it from the beginning, then you're planning how to disassemble it without yeah. you know, damaging things and, and actually keeping the rocks in one pile and the smaller pebbles in another pile, all those sorts of things. So Tim's come back, um, Tim Entwistle's has come back with another question about repurposing. Um, he said, I like the repurposing and personally prefer that to trying to relocate the garden itself. Show mm -hmm. gardens seem to work best as ephemeral displays as long as all the recycling goes on, as you suggest. Um, mm -hmm. What's your perspective on giving them a second life? So mm -hmm. I guess that's continuing that conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a lovely idea because it, it sort of brings that more of that dimension of time into the idea of the design of the show garden. So, you know, the, the, Show gardens are really quite, you know, like I was saying, they're quite sort of artificial and they're, you know, they're they're beautiful pieces of art. But, you know, to to consider how then the plants will grow and change and be positioned in different ways, it's like they do get a second life. And, you know, maybe it adds complexity as well to the design process. But I think it can be quite beautiful and just brings um, also the awareness of the cause that you're donating to as well and that gets all that exposure at the show so I, I think it could be a beautiful kind of partnership really yeah and I think that's a very important angle and I think that's what I was seeing at the Chelsea Flower Show was that that these charities or recipients were already in the public eye as mm -hmm. part as sort of part of the design stage of the garden almost not just being a, a recipient um yeah we've got um got lots more compliments Emma I'm just looking to see if there are some more um, some more questions from anybody. We we will have to wrap it up soon. So I guess quickly, if you've got a question, do put it through. Um, yeah, to uh, to ask Emma before we have to finish up. Um, it has been it has been a fabulous presentation. I think that the thing I've got really out of this is is that look behind the scenes. I mean, I've been visiting 
the flower show since it first started and to actually have your feedback on putting together two different types of gardens has been really quite an eye-opener um, for me and I'm sure for everybody. And next year when we all trot along to look at it, we'll uh, we'll be looking at the gardens with even more uh, knowledge and enthusiasm, I would imagine. So yeah. that's been that's been very good, I think. Yes. Yeah, so just having a quick look. Um, yes, more just more feedback saying um, how strongly um, the feeling that gardens are healing places and enjoying that perspective. Uh, Susan, uh, Shannon, what project are you working on now, um, and how do you apply? <laughs> and how do you apply for a spot in the Melbourne Flower Show? That's oh, a, that's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, to answer the first part, I, I work on um, a range of different residential garden designs. So that's what I'm, I'm mainly doing at the moment. But I, I also teach a bit at um, into the sustainable, the Diploma of Sustainable Design at the University of Tasmania. So that's that's a couple of things I'm juggling at the moment. Um, and how do you apply for a spot? So the, the border gardens and the balcony gardens competitions are probably the entry, entry level into the Melbourne Garden Show. So have a look on, on the website for, for MIFCAs and just keep an eye out for when they open up those proposals. You just put in an expression of interest and then if you get selected, um, the idea is that you you fund your own garden. Um, but what you can actually do is then look for sponsors. So you can even start thinking about sponsors even before they open up those applications and I would highly recommend that actually <laughs> or, or growing your own plants even if you can. Yeah. So, and certainly perhaps volunteer, volunteering for somebody else too so that you actually um, maybe have a year of, of just hands-on and, and starting to understand a little bit more about the whole whole process. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and also, you know, approach people. We, we have a fantastic supportive industry and that's the, the other thing I found is everybody, I didn't know anything about constructing a show garden when I started and I basically just went and, sent out spam emails to everybody and harassed people and everyone was just lovely to me and and so generous with their knowledge so ask just ask people yes i think that's very good advice and of course next year's um melbourne international flower show will be on i think it's towards the end of uh, march next year yeah uh, so we you know there'd already be people planning their their gardens well and truly uh for for next year's show Sometimes two years in advance, I think, that they've planned well ahead. It's a pretty big deal. So, look, yeah. congratulations again. I think that we've, um, apart from lots of accolades, we've come, I think, to the end of the the actual questions. So uh, it has indeed been a fabulous um, webinar. And, again, just to remind everyone, it, it, is, it was um, to help raise funds for the Nina Crone Writing Fund. So we will be seeing... Um, responses to uh, the money that we've raised through this webinar, thank you, Emma, um, in, in upcoming issues of the Australian Garden Journal. So <laughs> Francesca's nodding her head there. Uh, it, it really does make a huge difference to, um, you know, so many of the articles that we have, of course, people write uh, because it's their area of expertise, but to be able to commission somebody to write, um, so, as you said, an idea that had been kicking around in your head or one of the other ones that we've um, been able to pay for, it really does make a huge difference and it's lovely for us to be able to give good recognition and proper recognition to people who write for for our magazine so thank you to you emma and also thank you to everyone who attended tonight and supported us in this endeavor so i think without any more ado we just say thank you again very much and uh, bid, you, bid everyone a good night <laughs> thank you very much everyone. and thank you jennifer very much for a, a lovely chairing um, Oh, thank you. It's luckily I was able to move away from my barking dog, which happened <laughs> before this, everything started. So that made me feel happier. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Emma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. That's marvellous. Thank you. <laughs>